everyone. Uh, thank you for coming to the third in a series of events at Harvard Law School called Confronting Empire. Um, we're very excited to have with us today Jonathan Nitzan, who is a professor of political economy at York University in Toronto. He's written a number of articles uh, with Shin Shon Bichler, dealing with the political economy of Israel and the United States and other places, uh, as well as theorizing of capital in its, as a social relation, um, understood in terms of the quantification of power. Central to their theory is the concept of differential accumulation. Hopefully we'll learn more about all of this. Uh, it's relatively uncommon to have uh, this sort of perspective, I think, at Harvard Law School, and so it's fantastic to have you here. Um, they're doing big things. They argue it's uh, never possible to separate economics from politics. Uh, I think a lot of us are probably familiar with that argument. Um, but they go on to propose a, an entirely new theory of value. Instead of a utility theory of value or a labor theory of value, uh, they propose a power theory. They're very prolific. Um, in 2002, Nitzan and Bichler published The Global Political Economy of Israel, uh, and also a chapter called The Weapon Dollar Petrodollar Coalition in a collected volume called The Global Political Economy of Israel. Um, 2004, they published Capital as Power, and a chapter called Differential Accumulation and the Middle East War Beyond Neoliberalism, which appeared in Global Re Regulation Managing Crises After the Imperial Turn. And this past year, they published War Profits, Peace Dividends, which was the second edition of the 2001 uh, revised and expanded edition. I guess six years, you can add more data. Um, there is a wonderful website which includes many, many papers, talks, and other publications uh, by professors Nitzan and Bichler at bnarchives.yorkmu.ca. You can find that through the confrontingempire.com website and right there. Check it out. There's good stuff on there. Um, and the discussant today will be Tala Said, who is a SJD candidate at Harvard Law School. Uh, he is a fellow in health policy, biotechnology, and bioethics at the Petrie Flom Center. Um, and his dissertation is on the legal institutional economics of pharmaceutical innovation, uh, a critical assessment of strong patent protection and alternative innovation policies. Uh, he's got broad interests, which we now realize include uh, political economy from a declarian Nitzanian perspective. And what perspective? <laughs> I just made that up. Oh, clear. <laughs> and <laughs> an interest in institutional economics generally. So join me in welcoming. Thank you very much, Nate. Uh, when uh, I was asked to uh, come and speak in Boston, I, I really thought of the MIT Museum. I don't know, it's a small museum. It's, uh, I think about a mile and a half from here. I'm just curious, how many people, you, you're very busy people, how many people have had a chance to visit the MIT Museum? Oh, quite a number of you. Okay, uh, well, for those of you who haven't been there, the reason I'm mentioning the MIT Museum is because they have a very nice uh, presentation of holographs. Uh, and, uh, of course, some of you have heard the term hologram uh, all of those uh, futuristic movies. Uh, the concept and the mechanics of the hologram was invented by um, a Hungarian British physicist by the name of uh, Denis de Borg. And uh, he invented it in 1947. And then in the 70s, he went on to receive the Nobel Prize for this invention. And it's quite uh, an amazing thing. Um, the hologram is a system of trying to record the uh, interference pattern of incidental waves. And essentially what it does is it takes uh, a laser beam and basically projects it in, uh, in a particular way uh, on a plate. And then when you take the same laser beam and you 
projected again on the recorded plate. What you get is uh, hanging in midair, sort of a three-dimensional object. And you can go around the object and it's just there. Uh, so it's quite an amazing thing to look at, and for that reason, I suppose it's worthwhile to visit the MIT Museum. But the reason I'm telling you about the hologram is that it has another feature that uh, perhaps some people are not aware of, uh, and that is as follows. Uh, if you take a, a pebble and you throw it into a pond of water, then you have a wave structure expanding, like you see in this picture here. You take another pebble and you throw it into the same pond and you get another wave structure expanding. And you do that with the third one. So you have a third wave structure. Now let's hypothetically think that we can instantaneously freeze the pond. So we freeze the pond and we take the sheet of ice that we have just frozen and we take it and we just drop it on the floor. And we take just a slice of that sheet of ice. So it's like taking a slice of this picture, any slice. Any one of those slices is going to actually contain all the information that you need in order to say what has happened in the plot. It doesn't matter which slice. Because of the curvature of the incidental waves in the intersection, because the waves are everywhere, every slice of the pond contains the whole picture. Hologram and free translation from the Greek it means the whole picture. So that's quite an amazing thing. And if you take a hologramic picture, a real hologramic picture, and you shatter it, and you uh, project on it a laser beam, you will get the whole picture. It will be a little fuzzier, but nonetheless, it will be the whole picture. Now, why am I telling you about holograms? Well, people talk here, uh, we have the fifth anniversary of the invasion of Iraq and the uh, wars in the Middle East. And when you open the paper uh, today, you hear about uh, economic crisis, you hear about stagflation, and the two things appear to be uh, quite different slices, quite different things, uh, and they belong to different departments in the university. Um, and they have their own discourses and their own categories, etc. Uh, I would argue that if you take any one of those slices, the war in Iraq, or the uh, unfolding process of stagflation we might be in, uh, in fact, you're taking a slice of the same hologram. And that hologram, I would argue, is the capitalist hologram. So the purpose of uh, my presentation today is to try to sketch in a, an hour or slightly more than that, some sort of a fuzzy picture of that hologram for you. Uh, I will uh, first spend some time talking about the theoretical basis of that hologram. Then uh, I will use this theoretical sketch to uh, say a few things about the history of capitalism from a perspective that uh, I'm sure you are totally foreign to, and most people are, unless they have read our work. And then after we have this theoretical framework drawn, the hologram, and then uh, we have some history attached to it, then we can basically kind of pick up those slices of the war in Iraq, post-inflation, and see that they actually uh, show us, if we like them correctly, uh, the capitalist hologram. Now, uh, what I'm going to talk about today should not be interpreted as some sort of a deterministic uh, structure of history, some sort of a description of the uh, laws of capitalism or the historical laws of motion of the capitalist system, not, a, not at all. But what I'm trying to do today is talk about the boundaries of the capitalist nomos, uh, sort of the historical, institutional, legal, ideological uh, perspective that actually sets 
the mindset of capitalism and the mindset of the rest of us. There's nothing inevitable about it. It is what it is. So I'm not trying to, to, to portray some sort of a deterministic history, although it might look like that. I'm trying to draw some limits. Uh, what is possible and what is impossible under the type of capitalism that we are describing. Uh, there will be plenty of figures and charts in this presentation. These figures and charts might be interpreted at first sight by uh, some people as uh, a form of number crunching, a form of hypothesis testing, and that's not the purpose at all. The purpose is actually quite the opposite. The purpose of this empirical work is actually to enable us to ask questions that otherwise are impossible to even conceive. Because unless you engage in the real history that emerges from your theoretical conception, you cannot, in fact, develop that theoretical conception. Because after you have taken the first step in a theoretical argument, the next step has to be, in some sense, validated. You know, you touch something, is it hot or is it cold? Unless you know it, you cannot continue from there. So the empirical work that we are engaged in, in fact, is the major generator of our ideas, rather than the major confirmation or the major test of our ideas. So think about it in those terms, and I'll come back to it throughout the presentation. Uh, now, finally, I want to say uh, in this preamble that uh, by necessity, I'm condensing here almost uh, three decades of work into uh, an outline uh, of an hour. So there are many holes and inconsistencies in what I say, uh, some of which will be completely invisible to you, but some of which might be visible to you. And uh, I will welcome questions, but you should appreciate that if you really want to get a more systematic uh, presentation of those ideas, then you can visit our website and also you can ask me, you know, what, what are the relevant things to read. Uh, in the uh, handout that um, was distributed, there's a list of some relevant uh, material that you can also consult. So that's by way of introduction. Uh, where's the handout? Now we will keep questions to the end unless you have a technical question regarding to uh, an explanation of a graph or a chart, then uh, maybe you can uh, intervene and ask me to clarify. Let's begin with this capitalist hologram. The first thing that we know, uh, and we are not the first thing to know it, uh, is that Capitalism is a quantitative system. It's the most quantitative social system known to us. And the major unit of quantification, of course, is the price. Uh, capitalism is based on private ownership, uh, and ownership is defined in terms of its quantity by the price of what you own. And the price system is for that reason, the capitalist price system, the most uh, elaborate quantification of society that is known to us. Now, because the architecture of capitalism is quantitative, based on price, the two basic myths of capitalism, the liberal neoclassical myth on the one hand and the Marxian myth on the other hand, are both based, although we no longer pay too much attention to it, but in the final analysis, they are both based on theories of value. So the liberals have a utilitarian theory of value, the basic unit of which is the util. You might not know it, but whenever you, you speak about economic growth, or about real wages, or about real investment, uh, all of those measurements are Essentially, when you boil them down to the elementary part of it, uh, are based on the notion of the user, the unit of enjoyment. The Marxian system is similarly based on an alternative 
elementary particle, and that elementary particle is abstract labor, or socially necessary abstract labor. So we have a quantitative system, and in order to theorize that quantitative system, both schools of thought have developed theories of value. And those theories of value are based on two elementary particles, the util and abstract labor. Now, uh, there are many things that are very different between these two approaches, but they also have some uh, shared characteristics. And I'll speak, mention here two important ones. The first characteristic is that both systems have a value system that is essentially materialistic. So both utils and abstract labor are anchored in the sphere of consumption and production. This is where they are generated. This is where they are defined. These are the boundaries which contain those units. So they're both materialistically based. The second uh, shared characteristic of these two systems is that they're bifurcated. They're bifurcated in the sense that they have an economic system where value is defined, and they have a political system. Now, the political system, if you're a liberal, is usually some sort of a distortion, unless it's a minimal thing. It usually constantly intervenes and distorts and uh, interferes with the proper working of the economic system. Uh, the Marxists have it uh, very uh, different, in a different way. They think of the political structure as something that enables the economic accumulation of value, and it's absolutely necessary for the process of accumulation. But nevertheless, value is created in the economic system, and the political system is another system, a superstructure, that enables that economic system to exist. So in both cases, we have a bifurcation. In one case, we have uh, a political system that interferes with the economy. And in the other case, we have a political system that enables the economy. But there is a bifurcation. Now, in our work, um, we are writing, we're completing now a book that is called Capital as Power, uh, that will uh, hopefully be out this year. Uh, we engage with these theories. And the bottom line of our argument is that both of these approaches to the capitalist system break down. They break down because their elementary particles are impossible. Utility and abstract labor are impossible categories. They're impossible empirically, but more fundamentally, they are impossible logically and philosophically. So I'm not going to get into a detailed discussion of why this is the case. But we are arguing that because those two fundamental units are impossible, the very bifurcation between politics and economics becomes impossible. So what we have been working on the past, over the past uh, 20 or 30 years and again, this is something that emerged from our empirical research or historical research. We asked questions to which we didn't have answers and therefore had to develop new theoretical concepts. Uh, we are arguing for an alternative approach altogether. What we are arguing is that what is accumulated in terms of dollars and cents represents not utility, and it represents not abstract labor, but it represents commodified power. So accumulation is accumulation not of things, but accumulation of power. From this perspective, capitalism is not a mode of consumption, and it's not a mode of production. It's a mode of power. Now, if you take this focus and you say, well, instead of having uh, sort of a dual world of uh, economics and politics, I'm going to have a single world of power then you have to start changing your categories because the old categories no longer fit to this new hologram. And once you start dealing with power, you can no longer deal with this category that Marx called capital in general or with the category that uh, uh, Alfred Marshall named the sort of the representative, representative consumer, the representative capitalist, the normal, the average, you have to start dealing with the units of power. And this is where the notion of dominant capital comes in. It's not capital 
capital has its own inner structure, and in that inner structure, there is what we call dominant capital. What is dominant capital? Dominant capital is made of the leading capitalist organizations, leading corporations, and the way that they're intertwined with government organs. So there is no such thing as capital without government. Never was, never can be. So when you speak about dominant capital, we talk about corporations as they are intertwined with governmental and other uh, organizations of power. And these are the large firms at the center of the political economy. Secondly, when you speak about dominant capital, you no longer, and when you speak about power, you no longer can speak about, about accumulation in absolute terms. So it's no longer the, sort of the Archimedean uh, basis that you take, you take a, sort of a, a relativistic <coughs> perspective. You talk about differential accumulation. Not absolute accumulation, but differential accumulation. Accumulation has to be thought of as a relative thing, not in a, as an absolute thing. So we have two categories, two new categories that emerge from this notion of capital as power. And these are dominant capital and differential accumulation. In the capitalist system that we live today, uh, and certainly since the middle of the 20th century, uh, capitalists, all of them, not just the big ones, but all of them, uh, think in terms of benchmarks. They think in terms of beating the average. Differential accumulation is always about some benchmark. Uh, if you are a small investor, you look at the list of all fund managers and you ask yourself, you know, who are the ones who beat the average, who are the ones who do not beat the average, who, who may, am I going to choose? Uh, if you are a large corporation, you are always having a list of the Fortune 500 or the S&P 500, that's your benchmark. If you invest in commodities, you have the Economist Commodity Index or whatever index that you try to beat. Uh, I worked for about five years in a financial consultancy group, uh, the bank credit analyst, and I've never heard the word profit maximization even once. The only thing that matters is how you do relative to the average, whether you outperform, outperform or underperform. So differential accumulation is the only jargon that capitalists understand, and the only jargon that they actually care about. And that works both on the way up on, on the way down. In other words, if you open the newspaper today, you hear about the uh, Bear Stearns collapse. Uh, Bear Stearns uh, went from, uh, I think, $160 a share to $2 a share. That's massive decline. Uh, J.P. Morgan has also gone down. But J.P. Morgan is in a very good position because it has gone down by far less than the average. So everybody is going down. But in terms of power, J.P. Morgan is gaining power because it actually collects an entire organization for $2 a share, something that costs $160 a share. And when times are going to pick up, it is going to be in a different position altogether. So when you think about power, it doesn't really matter whether things are going up or down. What matters is the relative performance. And if you think about it, in terms of the implications of relative performance, say the average grows by 10%, and you do 15% systematically, what is going to happen is that gradually your share of the total is going to go up, right? In terms of percentage, because you're constantly gaining more than the other. So in relative terms, your control of the total becomes larger. But if everybody is contracting by 8% and you're contracting by 2%, the same thing happens. Your share of the total is growing. So differential accumulation and redistribution are two sides of the same thing. You start from power. You think of dominant capital. You think of differential accumulation. You think of redistribution. What happens here in the capitalist mindset is that the driving force is actually redistribution. It's not accumulation for the sake of some enjoyment pleasure. Now, once we think in those terms, in redistribution of relative terms, then subsequent categories uh, seem to disintegrate in terms of their significance for us. 
And what I'd like to talk today about uh, are uh, two categories. One is the category of growth, and the other is the category of price stability. <clears throat> Economists tend to think of growth and capital accumulation as if they're synonyms. So when the economy is growing, then capitalists accumulate, and when you talk about accumulation, you talk about growth. The two are thought of almost uh, as synonyms. Now, growth uh, is an important process, and again, I'm not going to go into the critique of growth. But it is of relatively little significance when it comes to differential accumulation. And uh, I'd like to begin with the first graph to illustrate why am I saying that. So this chart, again, uh, unless you have uh, happened to read some of our materials, this is the first time you will see anything like that. Um, this is a chart that displays the ratio of mergers and acquisitions to greenfield investment. Now, mergers and acquisitions essentially are measured by the amount of money that capitalists spend in order to buy the operations of other capitalists. Greenfield investment is the amount of money that capitalists spend in order to buy and to build new factories, new facilities that didn't exist before. So one represents taking over existing facilities, the other represents creating new facilities. And the ratio that we compute here is the buy to build ratio. So every year what we do is we measure the volume in dollar terms of mergers and acquisitions, and we divide it by the dollar value of greenfield investment. And we plot it uh, over a long period of time. Now we plot it, if you look at the scale, it's a logarithmic scale. For those of you who do not know what the log scale is, essentially the effect that the log scale has is to condense very large variations and expand small variations. Because uh, what you see here is something that grows exponentially. So if, if this would be just a uh, simple arithmetic scale, you would see something that goes like that and then goes vertical. You would never know what happens here. So logarithmic scale kind of uh, condenses and stretches the observations in ways that uh, is more useful to look at. And I'll leave it at that. Now, it's, a, it's an interesting story that we see here. We see that uh, at the end of the 19th century, there were almost no mergers and acquisitions. Uh, mergers and acquisitions uh, in 1896 amounted uh, for uh, less than a cent on a dollar of greenfield investment. 0 0.3 cents for every dollar of greenfield investment. Uh, if you fast forward to the end of the 20th century, for every dollar of greenfield investment, you have $2.18 of mergers and acquisitions. Now, over that period, mergers and acquisitions have grown more than 350% faster than greenfield investment. This is what capitalism does now. Uh, most of the emphasis is on mergers and acquisitions, and less and less is on greenfield investment. Now, from uh, a perspective of absolute accumulation, whether you measure it in utils or in abstract labor, that makes no sense, because it doesn't do anything. It just changes ownership. That's what you have changes in ownership. But from the perspective of differential accumulation, it makes all the difference in the world. Mergers and acquisitions turn out to kill three birds in one stone. First, of course, if you merge with another company or take over another company as a capitalist, then you gain greater control just as much as you gain if you build new capacity. But you don't build new capacity. Just for as a sort of a thought experiment, let's imagine that today, all capitalists in the United States uh, take all the money that they put in the mergers and acquisitions and plow it into greenfield investments. Now, initially, you have uh, an investment-led boom, but very quickly, you will have plenty of factories that uh, nobody has uh, demand for the products. The reason why the Chinese can do it is because they export all of it. But you, know, you cannot have all capitalists constantly building factories. <coughs> 
Uh, so what you have here is a situation that mergers and acquisitions actually increase from the perspective of the large capitalists. They increase their capacity without creating any risk of glut. On the contrary, in many cases, when you acquire it, uh, another firm, you dismantle half of its operation. So it increases your control without increasing the risk of glut, in fact, reducing the risk of glut. That's one thing. The second thing is that mergers and acquisitions make you very big. And for that reason, they actually reduce the risk. Uh, it's true that large firms can fail, but if you look at the overall numbers, large firms do not fail. What happens is that they disappear almost solely because they're being taken over by other firms. Small firms disappear all the time because they go bankrupt, but large firms rarely do. Uh, so risk is reduced dramatically. Also, diversification increases dramatically, which reduces your risk. Uh, regional diversification, currency diversification, all of those things reduce your risk. So on the one hand, you increase your control. On the other hand, you reduce your risk. And finally, it's a major engine of differential accumulation because by definition, dominant capital, which are the main engine of uh, mergers and acquisitions, they're the ones who are actually buying other firms. They grow very fast exponentially, but the average actually doesn't because these firms are very few. There are a few hundreds of them. So if, they are, if the numbers go down, it doesn't change the overall number of firms. So the average size of firm remains actually more or less the same as a consequence of those mergers and acquisitions. But the size of the big ones grow and grow and grow. So this is a major engine of differential accumulation. It allows large firms to grow relative to the average without endangering the situation, in fact, by making it more secure. Now, the other thing that we see in this chart is that the process is not smooth by any means. It goes through waves. So you see here four waves. The first wave is the so-called monopoly wave. It's the turn of the 20th century. This is where firms were, large firms were created in their own industry. The second merger wave took place around the 1920s, and it was called the oligopoly wave. This is where integrated firms were created in this sector. So an integrated oil, oil firm, for example, all the way from extraction to distribution. Uh, in the 60s, you have another merger wave. And that was the conglomerate merger wave, where, merger wave where firms expanded all the way to the national boundary. And since the 80s and the 90s, what we see is the expansion of the fourth merger wave that we can probably characterize as the global wave, global merger wave. Now, this progression is kind of a necessary progression. It's unavoidable in the following sense that mergers and acquisitions, unlike the expansion of uh, greenfield capacity, uh, they have no limit. There's no limit on, logical limit, on the number of firms you can buy in your own sector. So conceivably, the automobile sector can be reduced to a single firm. And in fact, that's more or less what happened in the US. You might have seen the movie Tucker uh, about uh, this uh, automobile uh, producer invented all those wonderful things and produced 200 cars and was gone out of business. Uh, most of the um, GM uh, models used to be independent firms and they were essentially gradually over time merged. So there were about 200 automobile firms at the turn of the century in the US and now there are maybe two and a half or something like that. So there's no limit on the size of firms in the own sector. But the problem is that once you acquired everything worth acquiring in your own sector, you have to, in order to continue, you have to break the envelope and go to the next sector. There's no other choice. You cannot continue and acquire in that sector. So this is a logical progression. However, that progression is not some sort of a business progression or an economic progression. It's a very social transformation. If you think, for instance, what happens now in Korea, that Korea is going global. So in 10 years, all those chables are basically sold to foreigners. And the Korean capitalists are going and invest outside of Korea. But if you speak to some of the uh, left 
uh, people in Korea, you'll hear about the massive social dislocation that this type of breaking the envelope causes. It's a major transition in the Korean society. So every one of those breaking of the envelope is a social transformation. And therefore, every one of those breakings of the envelope tends to be quite traumatic. It tends to uh, uh, increase over time, and then there is a collapse. So the mergers and acquisitions progress in waves, and there's always some interruption that uh, can last five years or 10 years or something like that. This is historical description. So we have a long-term rationale for the process of mergers and acquisitions, which is interrupted by some violent decline. And these declines lead us to the other logic, the logic of inflation. So, so far, we started with the notion of power, and we explained why firms actually are interested in mergers and acquisitions because this is the way that can, the power can be expended in the most effective way on the large scale of business enterprise in the context of large governments, but it is not a smooth process, and it's always fractured by those interruptions. So let's now shift gear and speak about inflation, the other mode. Uh, we hear constantly that capitalists uh, like price stability and inflation is a horrible thing, and that we should avoid it at all costs. And the reason is that inflation is a destabilizer of society. It's a major force to destabilize society, and it, there is a, quite a lot of truth to it. However, there is another side to inflation that tends to be ignored both on the left and on the right, and that has to do with redistribution. Uh, Milton Friedman used to say that inflation is always and everywhere a monetary phenomenon. Now think of inflation running 20%. You probably don't remember that kind of inflation, but uh, uh, I remember quite vividly inflation of 400% when I lived in Israel. And uh, some people who come from other parts of the world might remember inflation of 5,000%. And some people who lived in Germany in the 1920s uh, might remember inflation uh, of 100% a day. So think about prices rising very fast. They never rise at the same rate, do they? They rise at different rates. But if prices rise at different rates, that means redistribution. Because those who manage to raise their prices faster than the others actually redistribute in their favor. So let's paraphrase Milton Friedman and say that inflation is always and everywhere maybe a monetary phenomenon, but it's also always and everywhere a redistributional phenomenon. Now, most economists would say, so what? Sometimes x wins and sometimes y wins and it goes you know this way and that way and it balances up over time so this is just kind of stochastic noise in the background it's true it might redistribute income but it's temporary until equilibrium reestablishes true value so the test here if you like is whether the redistribution is systematic or not systematic because we all agree that it exists because logically you cannot deny it prices do not change at the same rate. So let's, let's look at some evidence. We have plenty more evidence. I just chose a couple of charts. And both of them follow the same logic. In both charts, I'm looking at the rate of inflation, which is measured by the consumer price, uh, sorry, by the wholesale price index, the rate of change of the wholesale price index. And I'm comparing that rate of inflation to a measure of distribution. In the first chart, I'm comparing the distribution between capitalists and workers. In the second chart, I will be comparing the distribution within or between capitalists. So let's focus on the first chart, chart number two. Uh, the dotted line essentially takes corporate earnings per share. So this is the profit of all corporations in the S&P 500 divided by the number of shares of all S&P 500 firms. So this is how much profit each shareholder has a control over. And that's a unit of ownership of capital. And then I compare that to the wage rate. Now, if this ratio goes up, it means capitalists are winning relative to workers. And if this ratio comes down, it means that capitalists are losing relative to workers. Now, 
So the argument that redistribution is a stochastic process, it is a random process, then there should be no connection to inflation. But as, as you can see, there is a connection to inflation. And it's actually quite tight, considering the fact that redistribution is affected by many other things in addition to inflation. And remember here, what matters is the direction of the series. So if you look at it, you see that in most cases, when inflation goes up, the ratio of profit to wages goes up as well, and vice versa. So in that sense, inflation is very tightly correlated with distribution from workers to capitalists. Now, let's move to the next chart, which shows a similar diagram, but comparing the rate of inflation to redistribution within the corporate sector. So what I do here is I compute a slightly different indicator. I take the markup. The markup essentially is the amount of profit relative to sales. So if profit is a uh, billion dollars and sales uh, are 10 billion dollars, the markup will be 10%. So I'm comparing the markup of the largest Fortune 500 firms to the average markup in the business sector. Now, if you compare these two markups and the ratio goes up, it means that the Fortune 500 are doing better than the business sector as a whole. So there is a distribution from small ones to big ones. If it goes down, it's the other way around. Now again, what you see here is that inflation in general works to redistribute income from small capitalists to large capitalists and vice versa when inflation declines. So in both of these cases, when you look at the redistribution between workers and capitalists and within the capitalist group, you see that inflation is a pretty systematic redistributor of income. Now, the question that arises from this systematic pattern, and again, <clears throat> there are many more examples that I can show you. <coughs> so this is not unique. <coughs> <coughs> now the question that would uh, arise when you sit there in the audience and you look at these charts if uh, inflation is so good for capitalists, capitalist dominated system, why don't we have inflation all the time? And, and the answer is that we do. Sorry. We do have inflation all the time. Uh, this is information that pertains to the consumer price index in the UK going back quite a while uh, to the 13th century. Of course, the earlier data are very inaccurate, uh, but uh, we're not trying to be very precise. We are trying to paint an overall picture. And what is the overall picture that we see here? The reason I'm using the UK is because it has the longest stretch of data. Uh, we have also pretty uh, decent data for the US going back to the 18th century, and they look more or less the same. What we see here is two things. First, most obvious uh, fact is that the 20th century is different. Previously, in the first five centuries in this chart, prices have risen by had risen by less than 800 percent. In the 20th century, all the way to 2007, uh, they rose by almost 6,000 percent. Quite a lot faster. So it's a different order of magnitude altogether. Now remember that the political economists that we follow uh, were writing with the 19th and 18th century in mind. If you look at the 19th and 18th century uh, here, you see deflation. They were concerned with deflation. They didn't know anything about inflation. For them, it was not even on a radar screen. Uh, but we cannot claim uh, clemency here. We have enough experience to know that inflation is 
a permanent situation. I bet that none of you remember a single year in which, infl in which inflation was not positive. Prices didn't go up. They always go up. Uh, with the exception of the Great Depression, which is also a very interesting story. If you are interested, I can talk about it later. So that's the first feature, that the 20th century is massively inflationary. The second feature is that whereas previously, even when prices were rising, they were rising and falling. So this was a pretty irregular process. In the 20th century, again with the exception of the uh, 1930s, prices are only going up, never coming down, always up. So we live in a period of inflation. We have inflation all the time. This is an inflationary century, no question about that. Now, so inflation is redistributional. We have it all the time, so why is it that capitalists uh, don't like it? Reasonable question to ask. Well, uh, the first answer is that sometimes they do like it. Uh, but, but the main reason they uh, are hesitant about it is that inflation is a very risky business. <clears throat> See, we spoke about the fact that prices do not rise at the same rate. And furthermore, that inflation is a redistributional process. I've shown you that inflation is a redistributional process. Redistribution is about conflict. Conflict means instability. So inflation, in fact, <laughs> tends to appear together with crisis. Now again, this is not music to the ears of neoclassical economics, but unfortunately the facts tell us that inflation appears together with crisis. This is what the concept of stagflation comes in. The concept of stagflation was popularized by Paul Samuelson uh, in the 1970s uh, to denote an anomaly, something very surprising, that prices rise in the midst of stagnation. Stagnation plus inflation means stagflation. That's something that shouldn't happen. Because if you are a liberal economist, you would say, well, good times means growth, means low unemployment, means bottlenecks, means all sorts of things that cause prices to rise. And bad times, recession, depression, unemployment, <coughs> means people cannot raise their prices, so it should be price stability or even deflation. So if you look at this chart, the relationship should be positive. The dots should be arranged in this particular way. Um, I don't think I explained this job, so maybe I should explain it just very briefly. What we have here on the bottom, uh, this is what happens. You get a little bit carried away in your own thoughts and you don't really think about the audience. Uh, and the audience is uh, very polite, not to mention. <laughs> So on the bottom, uh, we're measuring uh, the growth of GDP in real terms. This is a very problematic concept, but I'm using <coughs> the neoclassical or the liberal perception to show that their own perception using their own logic is actually leading to something quite different than, than they argue. So I'm measuring GDP growth on the horizontal axis, and I'm measuring the rate of inflation on the vertical axis. So every point on this chart, if you project it down, you will get the rate of growth. And if you project it to the side, you will, sorry, to this side for you, you will get the rate of inflation. Now, the added bit to it is that these data are smooth as 20-year moving averages. Now, don't get too excited about it. What it means is that every point shows you the average for the last 20 years. So for instance, 2007 uh, here means that in the 20 years ending in 2007, the rate of growth was about 3% on average, and the rate of inflation was about 2.5% on average. So if you look at this huge set of data, long-term tendency in US capitalism, inflation tends to appear together with low growth, stagnation plus inflation, whereas price stability or deflation appears together with growth. So stagflation is nothing of an anomaly. In fact, it's the normal situation of inflation. It tends to appear with crisis. And that is why capitalists are hesitant about it, because it's a risky thing. You don't know how it's going to necessarily unfold. It involves conflict. Okay. So it's a double-edged sword. As far as capitalists are concerned, I'm taking a sort of a quick summary here. As far as capitalists are concerned, 
They would prefer the large ones, mergers and acquisitions, if possible, because that's kind of a sure way to success. But when mergers and acquisitions go into uh, reverse, when they collapse, and capitalists are with the back against the wall and they cannot differentially accumulate otherwise, they will start considering inflation, because inflation is a, pro is a process that distributes income from workers to capitalists and from small to large firms. So it's a risky business, but sometimes you take risk, uh, especially when the return is commensurate with risk. Now, taking these two concepts, which are completely counterintuitive, so economic growth is not that important. What is important is mergers and acquisitions. Price stability is not what capitalists necessarily like under all circumstances. There are circumstances in which they very much like inflation. Put them together. And what you get is a completely different picture. You will never be able to get to this picture unless you have engaged in empirical work. So you would never be able to even imagine that question. That's why I was saying empirical work is here is not for the purpose of proving a point. It's for the purpose of asking the question in the first place. What we are doing here is trying to contrast these two processes together. The process of mergers and acquisitions on the one hand. So this is the bottom. Um, series. Essentially what it does, it takes the buy to build indicator from the first job and basically expresses it as a five year moving average. So every point is the average of the past five years. It just smoothes the fluctuation so you can see the overall uh, cycle. And here it's slightly more involved. It's this sort of a synthetic index that we call the stagflation index. What is this stagflation index? We, it's composed of two indicators. One is the rate of unemployment, the other is the rate of inflation. And in every case, what we measure is the deviations of that indicator from its own average. So we measure the fluctuations in the rate of unemployment around its own average, and the fluctuations of inflation around its own average, and we add them together. So when the rate of stagflation is zero, that means the average stagflation. And the rate of stagflation is above zero, it means a more intense stagflation or less intense stagflation. Now, I think that this is uh, quite an amazing historical picture. Because what you see here is actually these two processes that are completely counterintuitive actually work increasingly as mirror images of one another. You have a process, a long-term increase in mergers and acquisitions, but every time, and increasingly since the turn of the century, every time that you see a decline in mergers and acquisitions, you have a rise in stagflation and vice versa. Increase in, since the turn of the 21st century? Or? I'm saying that increasingly from the first part of the 20th century. Uh, and the correlation becomes tighter and tighter over time. And I find that quite amazing because that suggests uh, quite uh, a spectacular success on the part of large capitalists to shift from one strategy to the other. I'm not saying this is a sort of a conscious process that is much more involved here, but nevertheless, this is completely counterintuitive. It means something counter to economic growth. It means something counter to price stability, and it has quite a lot to do with the accumulation of power in our society. Now, Let's focus on uh, what happened in the last period, uh, more or less from the 19. Get this. From the 1980s uh, to the present. See, these are these processes again. I'd like to remind you, our claim is that these processes are not business processes, they're not economic processes, they are broader so societal processes. So each one of them is sort of a regime. Uh, when mergers and acquisitions take place, usually uh, capitalist societies are relatively more stable, uh, relatively less conflictual. Processes of stagflation usually involve a heightening of conflict. A heightening of friction, and we'll see possibly, uh, you know, militarized conflict, etc. So there are different political regimes. Each one of them represents, so is a mirror of a different social order altogether. Now let's look what happened 
over the past 20 or 25 years. Since the 1980s, 1990s, we have a process of amazing increase in breadth. We call this process breadth, and we call this process depth. Mergers and acquisitions are breadth in the sense that they are expansion area, and stagflation is a process of depth in the sense that it deepens the distribution. And again, if you read our uh, uh, article, Dominant Capital and the New Wars, from 2004, we uh, quite systematically uh, explain the meaning of these two concepts. So we have a massive process of breadth. We have a global merger movement. This global merger movement is associated with uh, a neoliberal ideology. People speak about the global village, about peace dividends, etc. You're probably uh, familiar with these uh, concepts during the past uh, 20 years, at least for your reading. Some of you are young, not even to remember it. At the same time, we have a massive decline in depth. A massive decline in, in uh, the process of stagflation. And that is associated, at least rhetorically, with the notion of sound finance, restrictive monetary policies, central bankers getting their act together and restraining inflation and so on. So we have this uh, rhetoric of globalization and neoliberalism reflected in these two mirror images uh, one rising mergers and acquisition, and the other is declining inflation and declining stagflation. Now, in the year 2000, we have a massive turnaround. Uh, at that point, uh, we uh, published a piece in uh, 1999, I think, uh, will the uh, end of the global merger way lead to a global stagflation. Uh, this is 1999, so uh, all of this part of the chart was not yet there. Uh, I don't think that many people understood the question, let alone the answer. Uh, but nevertheless, we had a decline a year later, a drop in mergers and acquisition, a massive drop in mergers and acquisition. But we didn't have an increase in stagflation, very limited increase in stagflation. Uh, the reason is that the world had changed in quite a significant way. Two things happened. Yes? Yes, Professor. You keep saying that this one process is driving another process. Particularly, you are saying there is a uh, man process that leads to certain changes in the stagflation process. But how are you so sure about the causality there? No, I didn't say that. I just said that historically they are countercyclical. I didn't say that one process leads to the other. Well, you used that phrase. You said that it's and that leads to the you just said that. Yeah. Uh, well, if I said it, I didn't mean it. <laughs> okay, no, I'm not saying it. What I'm saying is that usually Actually, what... I, I want to make a simple remark about some previous charts, for instance, where you show that inflation is correlated with this redistribution across... Let, the let's keep it to the question and answer period, because this is a substantive question rather than a technical question. Okay? Uh, so, <clears throat> just to rehash, what I'm saying here is that there is decline in mergers and acquisition, but there's no pickup on uh, stagflation. And uh, the reason why stagflation didn't pick up in any significant way is twofold. A, we had a massive relocation of uh, production to Asia, and that has a disinflationary effect, a massive disinflationary effect. And related to it, and in parallel, we have uh, the demolition of labor unions all around the world. So an inflationary process, because it's a process of conflict and redistribution, if one side is very weak, obviously the conflict doesn't actually pick up. Now, that has caused quite uh, fear among uh, ruling <coughs> capitalist classes. In fact, uh, in 2003, Alan Greenspan, which was God in residence at the time, said that uh, there was an unwelcome substantial fall in inflation. I think this is the first and only time that a central banker in the United States talked about in a fall in inflation that is unwelcome. There was a real fear that uh, inflation is becoming too low. Uh, and 
why is that fear? Well, you see that uh, stagflation here was reaching uh, almost a post-year low. Why is that fear? And that fear is summarized by this chart. This is the chart of the debt load. The debt load uh, has different ways of measuring it, but the most simple way of measuring the debt load is to relate the debt load to the source that actually financed the debt, and that's the GDP, that's the income of the society. So out of that income, you pay the interest and you repay the principal. Now, you see, what happened in, two, in uh, 1929 was that uh, as firms started to go uh, bankrupt and uh, try to get rid of the debt, uh, GDP itself started to fall. And not only that, prices started to fall. So though the debt contracted during the Great Depression by only about 10%, GDP contracted by almost 50%. And look what happened. What, what, hap what happened was that the ratio of debt to GDP soared. This is what uh, Evan Fisher called debt deflation. You know, you, the more you kind of recall your debt, the more in debt you become relative to GDP. Of course, he lost $10 million in the stock market, which is equivalent to about $100 million today, uh, which was invested on the assumption that money is neutral. Uh, so uh, in 1933, he wrote this article on debt deflation. <coughs> Now, we're talking about 2002, 2003, somewhere here, when the ratio of debt to GDP is more than twice what it was on the eve of the Great Depression. Now, imagine what would happen if prices start falling. What would happen to the ratio of debt to GDP? So this is the China syndrome of capitalism. And you open just the newspaper today, and you realize what I'm talking about. That's what they're afraid of. of debt deflation augmented by price deflation. So stagflation is not picking up, and it's becoming really very serious problem. Greenspan is very serious and starting to inflate, starting to reduce interest rates massively in order to have inflation do something so it doesn't become negative. So what we have now is something very bizarre. We have a business sector that is scared, deeply scared of deflation. We have dominant capital that has seen its mergers and acquisitions go down and is yearning for some stagflation to rekindle its, its uh, differential accumulation. And we have central bankers that say that inflation is too low. Now, this is a pretty strong pro-inflation coalition, I would argue. But the problem is that you can want to have inflation, and you can, you can print money uh, until you are blue in the face, but it's like pushing on a string, as Keynes uh, once said. And the experience of Japan is a case in point. Money was made free, but inflation didn't happen. There was deflation throughout the 1990s. You need a spark. You need something to ignite the imagination of capitalists to tell them that now the situation is shifting. And from now on, prices are going to rise rather than fall. And historically, that spark came from a place called the Middle East. This is what oil comes into the picture. Yeah. <laughs> OK. So this is where the oil business comes into the picture. Uh, as you can see here, what I'm comparing here is the real price of oil. In other words, the price of oil in dollars divided by the consumer price index. So it's the relative price of oil. And I'm comparing it to the rate of inflation in the industrialized countries. And what you can see is that until recently, uh, the price of oil is a leading indicator of inflation. Because capitalists think about it as a barometer of inflationary expectations. Now, in order for if, indeed, inflation is a signal, if inflation is what pulls, uh, sorry, if price, uh, the price of oil is what pulls inflation up, uh, then you need to have some increase in the price of oil in order to kickstart inflation. That's the spark. But for that to happen, somebody has to make it. And these, who are the people who make the price of oil move? They are the sellers of oil which is mostly OPEC, or the oil-producing countries. 
and there are the buyers of oil, which are the large integrated oil companies who actually buy the oil and then distill it in various ways. Now, we all know that OPEC is making tons of money when the price of oil goes up, but you would expect somebody who buys oil to actually want the price to go down, not up. So you would expect the oil companies, who are the largest off-takers of oil, to actually want low prices rather than high prices. But the opposite is the truth. Uh, this chart shows you the relationship between the real price of oil, in other words, the price of oil corrected for inflation, and the share of oil companies in global profit. So just for the sake of argument, in uh, 1980, this is the height of the oil crisis, stagflationary crisis, the end of the world, etc. Uh, the oil companies at that point pocketed one-fifth of all global profit. That wasn't the crisis for them, was it? Now, this is a period then of the disintegration of OPEC, uh, the breath phase taking place, uh, mergers and acquisitions, globalization, neoliberalism, and the oil is going down and down. And the oil companies are going down and down. At the end of Clinton's presidency, the oil companies are a shadow of themselves. Uh, they have about 3% as compared to 20% of global profit. Now, remember we talked about deflation fears of the business sector. We talked about uh, dominant capital really yearning for some stagflation to take place. Now we have OPEC and the oil companies at that point here really keen on something happening in the Middle East because their situation is quite dire. Now, if you want to talk about coalition of the willing, this is it. This is the coalition of the willing. Everybody that actually counts is banking on something happening in the Middle East, the price of oil coming up, and our profits coming up, and our differential profits coming up, and our fear of deflation going up. Now, there's a little problem. And the problem is defined uh, by the Economist of London in 1999. Uh, there is a lead article that is called Drowning in Oil. Uh, the Economist is a great believer in an anti-Malthusian theory that uh, capitalism actually frustrates all those projections about the end of resources. And if you look at the Economist indicator of uh, raw material prices, they go down over time. And oil prices in 1999 were $10 a barrel. And The Economist predicts $5 a barrel. This is 1999. This is exactly the bottom there. Of course, then they had to eat their hat uh, and explicitly apologize. But the point was that the perception was that the world was awash with oil. This is what they wrote. The world is awash with oil. So how do you raise the price of oil in a world that is awash with oil, in which the price of oil has gone down from $100 to $10 in about 20 years? Well, the answer is cruel, but simple. It's called war in the Middle East. Uh, now, again, I'm cutting through the chase here. There are many stories that I can tell you and many analytical formulations to uh, explain, but I'll go directly to the bottom line here. Uh, and the bottom line has to do with differential accumulation, this concept of differential accumulation, and how it's connected to the, you know, the larger politics, the high politics of our world, in this case, the politics of the Middle East. But let me explain very briefly, I'm almost finished, uh, the technicalities of this chart. Uh, we take here what we call the Petrocore. The Petrocore is composed of the leading private companies uh, that own oil. Uh, nowadays, of course, there are all sorts of uh, state-owned companies that have become bigger. Uh, but in many respects, they are capitalistic for all intents and purposes. And if we are to actually continue this type of analysis, we'll have to incorporate them in. But the point is that this analysis was done in the late 1980s when these companies were not in the picture. So that's why we continue it. But I think the, the picture would be more or less the same. Uh, now, each of these bars is measuring the differential accumulation of the oil companies relative to the Fortune 500. So what we take first is the 
return on equity. So you take the profit of the leading oil companies relative to the equity. And then we take the return on equity for the Fortune 500. So we have the average, which is the Fortune 500, and we have the oil companies. And we take the difference between them. And we compute this difference relative to the Fortune 500 average. So we have some sort of uh, a scaling factor. But that, that's quite uh, sort of secondary. The, point, the main point here is that we compare the leading oil firms, the Petrocor, relative to their benchmark, which is the Fortune 500. Now, when the leading oil companies are doing better, then we have the gray bars. They're beating the average. When they're doing worse, we have the black bar. They are decumulating differentially. They're doing worse. They're all, trading the average. All these bars are black. Yeah, oh, sorry. I should look at this, not that. OK. Now, there are three interesting patterns here. The first pattern is, uh, sorry, one uh, uh, last piece of uh, information. Uh, the black bars are called danger zones for reason that in a minute will become apparent. And uh, these uh, kind of explosion signs uh, symbol, symbolize energy conflicts, conflicts that have impact on oil. Now, the three patterns that we see here are quite remarkable. The first pattern is that every energy conflict is followed by the leading oil companies beating the average. Everyone. Now, you would say, well, obviously, oil prices, prices rising, they're beating the average. OK. The second pattern that we see here is that the oil companies, with one exception, actually never managed to beat the average without there being a crisis beforehand. The only exception is here uh, in 96, uh, although uh, there was some uh, mayhem going in Iraq when Clinton decided to uh, bomb the hell out of them. But that's not an official war. So this is a nice thing to have in the sense that uh, it proves that you didn't mess with the data that there is something that is quite inconsistent with the theory. But in general, uh, it's pretty systematic. Now you can say, all right, well, this is a coincidence as well. But the third factor cannot be co just a coincidence. And that is that every one of those energy conflicts is preceded by the old companies actually trading the average. So when we conceived of this chart in the late 1980s, uh, Basically, what we were thinking of is that these oil companies, their relative performance actually predicts what, what is going to happen in the Middle East. If you have a period of prolonged trading the average, expect danger in the Middle East. And in fact, that happened. So this chart was created in the 1980s, and it seemed to have predicted in writing uh, both the first and the second go for, uh, without any time limit. I don't know when it's going to happen, but it does happen systematically. Uh, now, there is nothing deterministic about it. In fact, there are three periods here. The first period, uh, up until the middle of the, or the beginning of the 1980s, is uh, a period of depth. This is a period of stagflation, and the oil companies reign supreme. Every time they trail the average, immediately you get a conflict in the Middle East, and immediately they beat the average. But the subsequent period, from the mid-80s to the 90s, is when the oil companies, remember, have gone down. So they are kind of out. And during that period, you see very prolonged trading of the average without the conflict actually to pull them up. And that period probably has come to an end here, in this point. So this is what we have, you know, September 11 and uh, the rest of it. Now, let me try to summarize what I've said so uh, there will be some room for uh, you to express your uh, discomfort. Uh, it's, it's popular to say that the war in Iraq has been a failure. The, Explicit purpose of the war, of course, is to get the world uh, rid of uh, weapons of mass destruction and terrorism. And that has been a failure because we did not find weapons of mass destruction and terrorism continues unabated. 
the uh, unofficial but uh, more sensible um, cause of the war, many people argue, was to make oil cheap for capitalism to succeed. And that goal has uh, seemingly failed. Uh, I just read yesterday on Bloomberg that the price of oil crashed from 110 to 106 dollars. Uh, remember, it was 10 dollars a barrel uh, in the beginning of uh, 2000. So the war has been a disaster. Of course, it has been a disaster from the perspective of the inhabitants of Iraq and all the rest of it. And I have nothing to add over what uh, some of the other panelists uh, have said about that. But I'd like to, uh, you to kind of then rethink of what I was saying today. If you take uh, the broad contours of uh, this hologram of capitalism that I was trying to sketch here, and you think of capitalism not uh, as something that involves accumulation of real things or utility or labor time, but you think about it as a system of power, a system of power that is driven by dominant capital, a system of power that is driven by differential accumulation rather than absolute accumulation. A system of power that is alternating between mergers and acquisitions, which are relatively peaceful uh, periods, and more aggressive periods, more violent periods, more frictional periods, characterized by stagnation, stagflation, and conflict. This is the political economy of capital that we think of. And the current period is possibly a period of depth, of going into mergers and acquisitions. And uh, we argue that that probably would have been impossible without conflict in the Middle East. It doesn't mean that people sit in some back rooms or they have dairy dinners to decide uh, exactly when the conflict is going to happen. It just sets the boundaries of the capitalist process. And it says what is more likely and what what is less likely to happen from this very broad perspective. Now, from this viewpoint, the stagflation that uh, we see now, uh, the conflict that we see now, the new wars that we see now, from the viewpoint of dominant capital, from the viewpoint of trying to avoid global deflation, uh, from the viewpoint of differential accumulation, uh, maybe has not been a spectacular success, but certainly hasn't been a failure. So, so we've got about, I'd say, 25 minutes for questions to leave 10 minutes before the next uh, speakers. If you want to take some time to react. So basically, I'll try to keep it short and just offer up three questions. Feel free to answer one or three of them. Um, and so basically they're going to focus, they're going to obsess on, I'm more or less sympathetic with a lot of the larger story, and I just want to focus on pushing to clarify what I'm going to call either, I mean, analytics. Analytics either of a sort of micro-foundational or individual mechanism level, or analytics in a sort of logics level. So I'll just sort of, three questions, they proceed from more abstract to be abstract, and then feel free to do whatever you want with them. So the first, the most abstract, is the idea of capitalist power understood as a differential accumulation of institutionalized exclusion over capitalized assets. So here we can quickly ask a quick question. Sort of in social theory, I think there's a nice triptych of motivations that are understood at the individual level. Wealth, power, and status. So wealth can be the desire for use values, or it can be the desire to have more use values than others. The second quickly becomes a relative group. Power can be the desire to have an imprint on the world and effective agency, one's will manifested, or it can be much more relational. More power than others, power over others. And I'm being crude here. And then there can be st status, which can be the desire for mutual recognition or the desire to be envied by others, this Devlinite idea. Now, I guess I'm not quite clear on that level of sort of individual micro-foundational logics whether your account is suggesting that the motive force at the individual level of the firm or dominant capitalist is power over society relative to others just for the sake 
of power over society relative to others, or in an unstable relationship of differential power for the sake of status and, and Veblenite envy, or a Marxian Hobbesian logic of the projection of fear and greed and insecurity driving a relentless process in which no one has control, but everyone is more or less hooked up to the machine and finds their interest in it. Now, I know it's a little vague and unclear, but the reason I'm asking it is because it's not clear what the logic of the power here is. It's a capitalized logic, it's a commodified logic. It's not the logic of a sort of Weber or Hobbesian sense. But I'm just trying to get more about what the logic of the power might be. Is it Veblenite status or something else? That's the most abstract question. So a less abstract question is, in your 2005-06 article, A New Imperialism and New Capitalism, you, you suggest that what you're doing, what you've done here, is articulate the logic of differential capital accumulation. And, but you also advert to the idea that there's this other logic at the global level, which people talk about. The logic of geopolitical competition in an interstate system of Hobbesian war of all against all, where there's a projection of fear and greed, and national interest is pursued by states who are fearful of other states and grandizing power in this unstable game theoretic equilibrium situation. Now, here you've talked about capitalist power, so it's commodified power. Now, do you understand the state to be more or less completely fused? with the logic of commodified power, or do you also understand there to be a separate national interest geopolitical logic? And if so, do you think that helps explain the war as well? Or do you think the war is better understood primarily in the logic of commodified power? And that, the last question, um, and this one, the hardest probably in one, in one sense, which is, do you have a sense of the micro-foundational level at which the dominant capitalist interest of oil companies is understood by them and translated into the levers which explain that bar graph? Okay, that's it. Okay. Uh, the first question about the uh, three ways of classifying power, uh, I, I don't think it really matters for what we do. Uh, and you can, you can uh, assign the same question uh, for the for feudal lord. What drives the feudal lord? What kind of power drives the feudal lord? I don't care. Uh, for me, uh, whether it's envy, whether this is uh, showing that I have a bigger island uh, than you have, or uh, you know a larger corporation and so on, this is uh, quite irrelevant in the sense that if you take today capitalists, what what, what is the dominant um, conception that they have? is the capitalized asset. Uh, no matter uh, whether the person is, is a big capitalist, a small capitalist, or in fact, uh, a public official, they all use the same logic. What drives them personally, whether they get a better kick from their personal consumption, or a better kick from, the, from appearing at the top of the false list, I think it's, it's quite irrelevant for uh, I mean, maybe, it's, maybe you can show that it is relevant in some way, but uh, I, I don't think that, I think it's completely um, at, uh, um, <coughs> uh, spurious to what we are doing. Uh, we don't need it. It's unnecessary to, because uh, all of them are differential concepts. The way that you describe them, they're all differential. So they're all uh, incorporated into that concept. Secondly, about the notion of the state and the national interest, etc. Of course, this, this is a fairly complicated uh, question to answer. We're dealing here with a structure of power. <coughs> now, the concept of power, uh, if, if you follow Hegel, <coughs> I think, uh, is a concept that you can only define by its concrete manifestations. So power is not something which is abstract, and you define it in some abstract units. You define it through your own experience. So, uh, you know, human beings that have just emerged from uh, sort of the primate state, uh, for them, everything that moves is power. You know, wind is power, this is power. And then they, they start creating little gods, and they, they treat those little gods as power. Uh, then, uh, instead of having uh, a, a very democratic system of gods, they start creating little pantheons of the gods. And this becomes their system of power. Then they say, no, no, we want a monopoly. We want a monotheistic. So, so this becomes a system of power. And then they come and they say, no, no, forget about God, as Laplace said to Napoleon. 
when he asked them, uh, where is God in your uh, system? And he said, I don't need this hypothesis there. Uh, so science becomes force and power. Same thing here. Uh, you know, uh, power is essentially what we claim power to be. This is the logic that we impose on the world and gives us all the I think that the logic that uh, we live today and we are completely subsumed by, whether we know it or not, is the logic of capitalization and differential capitalization. So for me, uh, when I look at all this debate about sovereign wealth funds and whether you know, they're good or bad and so on, this is essentially capitalization of the state. All of those states become sort of quasi-capitalistic. Now, of course, you have a transition from a period in which you know, uh, feudal states are quite different than capitalist states. The state of Afghanistan is quite different than the state of the United States. Uh, we have different levels of analysis, but we have here a process that I think, uh, since the 13th or the 14th century in Italy, uh, this notion of capitalization uh, is becoming increasingly uh, all dominating and penetrating into our mindset. And that's the system of power that we are concerned with. Uh, lastly, uh, the question of the, of the sort of the mechanics of how these people think and how do you get from the point of this is our interest and how do we get to the point of having a war? Uh, this is a question that often arises. You know, when uh, Newton spoke about uh, gravity, uh, people looked at him and said, uh, "Well, this is a conspiracy. You know, how could two bodies that do not touch one another? You know, how could they affect one another in the distance? This is a conspiracy. Same thing." When we came with our theories, immediately it was conspiracy theory. I think that supply and demand is much more conspiratorial than this theory. Uh, because nobody has ever uh, been able to see the, this creature that is called supply and demand, utility, etc. Uh, we talk about real people, blood, uh, blood and oil. Uh, and uh, I think that the old companies understand what I've done here pretty well. Uh, they would, I mean, I can give you a lot of citations that demonstrate that, but that's no, no proof. Uh, if I could do it on my little Excel uh, spreadsheet program, uh, they know that the price of oil is what matters. The price of oil varies 10 times more than the production of oil. They know that. You don't have to be a genius to know that. You don't have to be at Harvard Law School to know that. Everyone who is in the oil business knows it. So these are quite trivial things. I don't think that that they are a matter of great conspiracy or great mystery. Uh, what exactly is the process by which decision making uh, takes place? Uh, we were once interested in it, and when we wrote about the global political economy of Israel, especially the Hebrew version of our book, it is full of rich details like that. You know, what is the mechanism? How? how the actual politics uh, evolved, the real human beings behind it. And Shimshon also wrote a book uh, with a uh, uh, great journalist in Israel, Shlomo Frankel, in 84, uh, it was called The Israeli Aristocracy of Finance, in which he described you know, the history of the Israeli ruling class, etc. Uh, I don't think it's necessary for this type of theory. You can add it, but it's not necessary because this theory <coughs> speaks only about sort of the broader logic that uh, these uh, types of accumulation processes are embedded in. Uh, exactly how this pro project uh, and how this process unfolds in detail is, I think, a subsidiary question. It's not of no interest, but it's of subsidiary interest for what we are doing now. Maybe, maybe some of you can actually uh, write at some point the excellent papers uh, to show what happened and, you know, the end of the beginning of the 21st century, a lot of the you know, Pentagon papers of the 70s. Those things eventually come out, uh, uh, but I think that it, they are a bit secondary. Uh, thank you so much for your lecture. It was really great. And anybody who wants my notes, please give me your email. But Can I? Just, you're, you're, <laughs> you're not going to like this question either because I, I'm going to try to pin you down on the causality thing, which you're really trying to avoid. But within your system, in your opinion, what do you think is the best strategy for bringing more of a lasting peace to the Middle East? Huh? Why would I dislike this question? <laughs> <laughs> well, let me try to anticipate other questions like that. Uh, 
instead of answering this piecemeal, I'll get to the end of it. And the end of it is very simple. The left has abandoned research of the capitalist system. We just don't know. We just don't know the world around us. Uh, we tend to treat anybody who deals with the uh, liberal discourse, with the liberal facts, as if they are uh, sort of cop-outs. Uh, we don't need to deal with those things. These are sort of liberal uh, questions. I think uh, what uh, is needed not only to bring lasting peace to the Middle East, but to make the world a more reasonable place to live in, is to start to investigate the world we live in today. So my, uh, I don't know if you're going to like this answer, but uh, we need to investigate the world around us. And this is what we have been trying to do. I cannot give you answers unless I actually research the question. If we don't know the situation from the perspective of capitalists, how on earth are we going to be able to put any resistance? If you, for example, are completely unaware of what I was talking about, from this perspective, you're going to basically shoot at a completely different target. You're going to actually uh, try to uh, persuade George Bush to do this or that. I mean, it's quite irrelevant. So uh, my uh, short answer to your very important question is this is the best endowed university in the world. Maybe you should uh, put up a research institute, a modest research institute that is actually going to investigate the capitalist order in a way that Marxists once did, no longer, but once did. That would be my short answer. I don't have a better answer, actually. Um, yeah, sorry, why would you want to go? No, no, you will. You will. Okay. Better than um, thank you so much. This is fantastic. And I was really excited to hear you talk about the politics of inflation because that is so often left out of everything. But I have one small question on that, and then I have another question which I'll keep really brief. But as so I understand the redistributive shifts from workers to capitalists and then also from a small to large capitalist. But I wonder about debtors and creditors when there are fixed interest rate terms, right? Do you think that that dynamic, so say there's there's a loan made to a debtor on a interest mm -hmm. rate, right? Then the person will end up, the debtor will end up paying back less in real terms with an inflationary setting. So do you think that that element is just insignificant and magnitude? No, it is very significant. It okay. is very significant. So, I mean, would that <coughs> negate some of the redistributive effects and like say the workers, the capitalists? Uh, let me say two things. Uh, did you finish your question? I'm sorry. Oh, yeah, actually. No, if you have. I'm finished. Yeah. I have another question I really want to ask. But it's separate. Yeah. Um, it, it is very important. But um, again, I didn't go into the technical details here. But uh, we have we talk about the conception of capitalization. Capitalization is the, the, sort of the discounted value of future earnings. So the, the quantity of capital itself depends on earnings. It's a discounting of earnings. So debt is a discounting of future payments. So in that sense, uh, the magnitude of debt, the magnitude of equity, the magnitude of capital is all something that derives from the earnings. It's based on the earnings. Uh, and therefore, you know, if something happens to the earnings, for example, if something happens to the earnings of the oil companies and the you know, Exxon is making $40 billion, a year, uh, then obviously if you look at the capitalization, it's going to be affected positively by it. Uh, so that's sort of analytically. The, the, the treatment of earnings is fundamentally, at a long-term level, quite more important than the treatment of the relationship between inflation and asset values. However, in the shorter term, it is incredibly important. So you have a process of debt deflation, for example, that could be quite rapid and quite independent of the level of earnings because it's based on fear. So there is much more to the question of inflation than what I was presenting here. And I think that your point is well taken. And uh, that is something that requires quite a lot more research. Okay. So uh, I, I cannot give you a cheap answer to that question. Thank you again for my time. And if you guys don't mind, I have some more information. So we talked about this at lunch, actually. Um, what, so there's a theory that one of the primary motivations for the invasion of Iraq was the staving off of setting oil exchange in the euro. And 
instead of the, the dollar. And I just wonder, first of all, do you think that it has merit? And second of all, what would happen to these patterns, these, this like alternating pattern of mergers and acquisitions and stagflation? I mean, is it set on a global scale? Would it just be a wash? Would it, if, would it stimulate some sort of crisis? Oh, if, if, if the oil exchange was set in euros instead of dollars? Well, uh, for those of you who might not know, uh, right um, after the invasion, there was this argument that uh, the Iraqis and other uh, governments in the Gulf tried to divert trading uh, from dollars, oil trading from dollars to the euro and other currencies. And one reason the Americans invaded is to prevent that from happening. Uh, I have no idea if this is something that was discussed in Washington or uh, you know, was important or not. Uh, but the point is that, uh, you know, the United States is obviously, in my opinion, uh, is in long-term decline on two grounds. First, it's on decline geographically relative to other regions of the world, but also it's, de it's on decline in the sense that the very state structure is changing quite a bit. So, you know, in 1990, about one uh, tenth, 10 percent of all the world assets were owned by foreigners. Uh, Sixteen years later, in 2006, about one third or 30 percent of all world assets are owned by foreigners. This is a tripling of foreign ownership. So uh, what happens with foreign ownership is that power becomes really global and transcending the states in very complex ways. Now, it's just projected into the future, another 15 years, it could be 60 percent. Uh, what would happen now to the question of what exactly is the U.S.? You know, U.S. capitalists derive 40% of the income from outside of the United States. If inflation, I'm just continuing, if inflation is a process that is necessary, then obviously you don't want a strong dollar, you want a weak dollar. So there are plenty of things that happen in parallel. And of course, uh, a group of people that identify themselves with the state, uh, when they feel in decline, uh, they do all sorts of things that are not necessarily you know, very coherent, and they go into all sorts of adventures uh, that might be uh, consistent with the interest of others without them knowing it. So I, I don't have a concrete answer to your question. I just doubt very much. This sounds to me like too narrow a reason to uh, type of uh, change your you know, foreign policy on 180 degrees and go from you know, global village to uh, war and terror uh, for uh, the fact that your currency is weakening for structural reasons. Uh, and and uh, of course, the setting up of those exchanges is just part of the process rather than the cost. Well, there's a question. Yeah. These are um, closely related questions. They're all pretty specific. Uh, so maybe some of, the, some of the answer to this is sort of well known to some of the people, but would you be able to explain just with a little bit of detail on how inflation does tend to reward differentially both um, large enterprises at the expense of smaller enterprises and capital at the expense of workers? That's the first question. And the second question is, can you give any sort of um, structural explanation as to why amalgamation and stagflation tend to be negatively correlated? Uh, it's actually quite difficult to answer those questions uh, very briefly. Uh, that means that they're very good questions. If you want to skip them, and I can ask you later. Uh, no, no, we want to hear the answer. <laughs> <laughs> okay. uh, well, first, let me go back to the notion that inflation is a redistributional phenomenon. We agree on that uh, logically. We have to, because inflation is an average of many changes in prices. So only by impossible fluke can all prices continuously change at the same rate. So it's, it's redistribution. And the question is, is the redistribution systematic or not? And what causes this redistribution? Now, we start from the perspective that uh, pricing uh, is a matter of power. So uh, price is a reflection of power. It's not a reflection of utility or production. It's a reflection of power. So obviously, redistribution is a manifestation of power. It's not that power explains redistribution. Redistribution is the evidence of power. Now, there is nothing inherent uh, in the claim that inflation needs to redistribute income from labor to capital. No. In some cases, for instance, in Europe, the situation, at least uh, in the 60s, 
in the 70s it was quite different than in the United States. Labor unions were stronger. In some cases, actually, inflation worked in their favor. So there's not, that's what I was uh, suggesting. There's nothing automatic on what I'm about what I'm saying here. And what you see is the consequence of power. Now, the problem with inflation is that, by definition, it averages out and aggregates something that has to be disaggregated. Because the essence of that process is redistribution and conflict. By taking an average, we are saying, well, all basketball games end up in an average uh, you know, score of a draw. But of course, we know that that's not the case. The same thing with inflation. Uh, I'll uh, skip the other question. It's just uh, uh, too involved to answer, although uh, I know that you want to answer to, to hear the answer. <laughs> Maybe we can deal with that later. It's just I, I don't think I have time for it. It's 15 minutes before the hour or so. Yeah, let's take, take one more question, and then people can come down and we can move around until the next Yes. Yeah, so I was going to ask you a sort of less sophisticated version of the question that Tava asked you toward the end. Uh, in the run-up to the war, there were sort of three explanations of motive uh, among leftists and war critics. The first, which, which you don't think seriously, which I don't think seriously either, was that the goal of the war was to dramatically lower the price of oil. I'm not interested in that. The second explanation, which you've been pushing, is sort of uh, radical mainstream in its, in its methodology with radical in its politics, and that is that the oil companies exert pressure on the government, and the government wanted to therefore push up the price of oil, and the war in Iraq has obviously achieved that, uh, whether that was planned or not. The third explanation is sort of a more traditional Leninist explanation, and that was that the United States, that the state and large American oil companies wanted to gain dominance uh, over Middle Eastern oil not solely for the purpose of pushing up oil, the price of oil, but they wanted to gain control over it relative to European, Chinese, or, or Russian oil companies. Um, and so my question, I, I guess I have two questions. The first question is, am I right in thinking that you prefer the second explanation to the third? Uh, and then secondly, if this is all about oil companies exerting power over the state, why is it that oil companies have such a differential impact, a differential control over the government? And if there are many, for every oil company, So you define this as a simple-minded question, right? Uh, well, I, I, I don't know that I'm actually sympathetic to the second explanation. Uh, I, I was very careful in the beginning to say that I'm delineating the boundaries here, and I'm not talking about conspiracies, and I'm not trying to kind of pin down, you know, there's a mechanism, this guy, you know, they meet in the club and they decide. Uh, that's not what I'm trying to do. What I'm trying to do is to say there are certain historical periods in which conflict becomes something that is tolerable and something that is desirable by a, a, a group of people that are in a position to actually resist it. And if they do not resist it and somebody pushes it, then that will be the result. Uh, I think that there are, um, what's the name of the guy, the journalist that wrote um, 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 Meadows or something like Greg that? Greg Powell. Greg Powell, yes. So he argues uh, that uh, to uh, sort of excavate it, uh, the existence of sort of a twin position, the position of the neocons that actually want, wanted to go in and reduce the price of oil and make the Middle East open for business and all this uh, type of logic. And then there were the oil companies who were sitting in the sort of back seats and saying, sure, go ahead. And once the United States went to the Iraq, they basically got their act together and they basically said there's not going to be any nationalization, there's not going to, and basically the end result was what they intended rather than uh, what the neocons intended, which are two opposite uh, ends. Uh, we are arguing for neither this nor that because we haven't investigated it and we, we are also not particularly interested in those questions. We're interested in drawing the boundaries of the logic of capitalism, which uh, have been abandoned. This kind of research has been abandoned. So I'm not saying these are not important questions to answer. What I'm saying is that uh, I don't know that it matters a great deal. What matters is that we are trying to kind of figure out what are the conditions that are possible 
uh, are more conducive to type of conflict. At what time capitalists are going to feel, sure, you know, the war in Iraq causes damage, uh, you know, people get killed, the price is higher, but at least we don't have deflation. You know, we're not going to say anything about that. So there is a coalition of the willing. There's a, a mindset that is created under certain circumstances that enables something like that. Was the war in Iraq inevitable? I would not say that. I don't know that. I don't think that anybody can say that, and I'm not suggesting some sort of a deterministic process in which the old companies are doing it. Now, the old companies, I'm just going to finish that, and sometimes they are very powerful, but not at all times. During the 1980s and early 1990s, they were very powerless. If you look at uh, this chart, you'll see they were not doing very well. Uh, they were not that powerful. So it is a question of what is the major direction of differential accumulation, whether it's breadth or depth, which makes them in this historical context important. Now, if you fast forward this 50 years into the future, the logic of this argument would probably not hold any longer, because there will be different forms of power. They will be commodified, they will be capitalized, but they will be specifically different. And then our discussion might seem completely irrelevant. <coughs> Thank you for coming and speaking. <laughs>